Well, good morning. Back in the home office for our Apologetics Thursday after our conference in Atlanta. Uh, great opportunity to gather with friends, pastors from around the South. Really great opportunity to kind of reconnect and talk about our ministries and how things are going and what God has been doing. So, um, well, uh, uh, as we mentioned before, uh, we take Thursday mornings nowadays to approach the subject of sharing our faith, answering hard questions, uh, being able to uh, uh, give a, a good, solid uh, reason for the hope that's within us, as Peter tells us to in 1 Peter 3.15, as we ultimately are called to fulfill the Great Commission, which is involved in going out into all the world and uh, bringing the gospel, uh, making disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe the things that Jesus has taught us. And so um, so part of doing that, part of that mission of going out and, uh, and sharing the gospel is being able to um, answer questions when people ask them about it. You know, uh, most people in the world, all people in the world, in some way or another, have an existing belief system. Um, we don't typically sit down and talk about belief systems. Uh, those of us in apologetics do all the time, but the normal person doesn't sit down and think about their belief system in any systematic way. Uh, instead, it's just kind of what they grew up believing, or they do a particular practice that they've done their whole lives, or uh, for others, they maybe have put some thought into it. Maybe they've come from one particular belief and have come to believe something else through some series of circumstances, or somebody uh, sat down and talked to them about something that really worked for them, and uh, and so they have gone into some other direction with their faith and their belief. Um, well, uh, let me throw an idea out there that is um, uh, might seem a little blunt at first, but um, it's worth considering. Uh, and that is that all religions in the world could possibly be wrong because they all differ fundamentally. On the surface level, a lot of religions, might even say most religions, on the surface are very, very similar. The idea that all of them basically have some kind of view of uh, of heaven or some definition of God or a God or multiple gods, but there's some deity or deities involved. Um, they all have basic tenets that teach you to treat others with kindness or to love one another and that kind of a thing. And on the surface, there are some very clear similarities between most uh, religions in the world. However, that's just on the surface. Fundamentally, all religions have distinctions that make them different from all others at a fundamental level. In other words, at the very core of their beliefs, they are <clears throat> different. Uh, and that may sound, uh, again, it brings back the statement that may sound a little blunt. All religions in the world could potentially be wrong, but there's no possible way that they can all be right. So when we say that all religions are basically the same, there's no possible way that all religions are basically the same because at a, at a core level, they all teach something very different. Uh, the Christian, the biblical Christian view of God is very different than, the, than the, uh, uh, the, the, the view of God in Hinduism or the gods in Hinduism, the pantheon of gods in Hinduism. It's very different from Islam, these kinds of things. And so um, it's possible that we could all be wrong, completely wrong. But there's no possible way that we could all just be right because we basically believe the same thing. Um, you know, in the Old Testament, there was a, a deity called Molech who was worshipped in this heinous way where babies were sacrificed uh, in the iron, white-hot arms of this steel god that had been, uh, uh, you know, fueled with wood and fire inside the belly of it. And, that, and you would lay your children on it, it would roll into the arms, into the fire and such. And it would just be this horrific form of worship of this deity called Molech. Well, how on earth do you compare that to something like Christianity or really to most other religions in the world in terms of their uh, forms of devotion in that? Um, and uh, on, on the other hand, too, if we think of something like even the Baha'i faith, which is a very all-inclusive kind of faith, even at the heart of that religion, there is still a view that you either accept that that's true or you are mistaken. And so there is, uh, there's really no way to say that all religions fundamentally are the same. And so therefore, because that's true, uh, and, and if we can establish that honest difference, um, then naturally what follows from that are some questions about why one religion may hold views that are true as opposed to other religions that may have views that aren't. Uh, now again, we're starting to step into a realm where that sounds all judgy and that kind of thing. But the truth of the matter is we all judge. 
And so if we can get past sort of the, the hiding from reality element of it, and we can begin to talk about you know, real issues and real questions, and we can do so, like Peter said, with gentleness and respect, we can get somewhere because now we're availing ourselves to asking questions, to considering answers, to following things through to their conclusions and understanding if in fact there is a perspective, maybe one perspective is more reasonable or has more weight to it than another. Uh, these are important places to get to in discussions, but all of that to say that we never arrive at that place if we don't acknowledge the fact that people have legitimate questions uh, that they will ask about why one faith is different than another. Why would we believe one at the at the setting aside of another and that kind of thing. So, um, so why study apologetics? Simply because people have questions. People have, they want to know. Um, doesn't mean that everybody who gets an answer is going to believe, but we should answer the questions that come. And that's the first thing I wanted to speak to in this con this idea of why study and why we should study apologetics. Uh, again, because it helps clear the path for belief. When someone asks a question as to why we believe what we do, it's important to have answers to those questions because if we don't know why we believe, then why should they, right? I mean, there should be some level of ability to answer why we believe, why I believe Jesus is in fact the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. He said that, but other religious leaders in history have said things too that are exclusive. And so why believe Jesus? Well, because he rose from the dead. How do you know he rose from the dead? That was 2,000 years ago. Well, good, now we've got a conversation going, and those questions are legitimate. When people ask those questions, some will ask, out of a position of antagonism. They're just looking for a reason to not believe, and so they'll just try and twist you in a knot so they can feel justified in their unbelief. That's a legitimate truth. Um, others are just honestly skeptical. I don't want to get duped. I don't want to believe in something and then find out later that I got taken advantage of or I got uh, made a fool of for believing something that makes no sense. Now, most people are in that area. Um, uh, maybe most is overstating, I don't know, but many to most people are in that kind of area. Uh, and this is why a lot of people just sort of kind of get behind the idea that all religions are the same, because this way I don't really have to choose one and be made a fool of if I'm wrong. I can just simply be good, because after all, most religions teach you that you should be good, and all this kind of thing. It becomes easy to sort of camp out in the skeptic category. But the question of whether or not we're being an honest skeptic has to come to play at that point. Is it that I'm not willing to find out if there's in fact uh, an objective truth out there? Or am I just trying to play it safe? And therefore, I feel like if I stand before God one day, whichever God that is and whatever that looks like, I can say, look, who knows which one of your religions was the right one, so I just did my best. That That's a common way of approaching religion. But it's not really objectively honest, if we're going to be honest about it. It means that uh, we're just sort of kind of hiding behind something to play it safe. But it doesn't necessarily mean that what we believe is true. We're just being comfortable and safe and trying to avoid being looking like a fool. I understand the motivation behind that, but it's not necessarily honest. And so we want to consider, um, you know, maybe digging deeper than that. Um, and then, of course, we want to have answers for those who are just honestly seeking, for those who are genuinely wanting to know. They want to believe what's true. And if we can give them the answers that God has given us, if we can share these things with us, then at the very least, whether or not they believe, that is something that only God can ultimately determine. But at least we've given them plenty of sufficient reason to consider what Jesus has said, the truth claims of Christianity, the biblical faith that we adhere to and hold to and believe in and are resting our eternity upon. We can share those things with them and they can mull it over and they can think about it and they can see how well that deals with the questions and skeptic uh, the, the, the honest skepticism that they're bringing to it. That's a very healthy place to be. I think that there's something very good about someone who is honest enough to ask questions with a genuine desire to understand the answers that we can give. And I promise you, if you're not giving answers, if I'm not giving answers, somebody's giving them answers. And if we're not willing to provide something that, that deals with the things that they're concerned about, they're wondering about, somebody else will. And if those are the best answers they can find, then they're likely going to begin to walk down that path. And so answering people's questions, clearing the path to belief, to faith, to understanding, to ultimately putting their trust in Christ, this is an important thing for us. Secondly, it helps us get a better understanding of our own faith. 
again, if we don't really know why we're Christians, if we just sort of grew up in the church and so therefore we are, which by the way is where tons of young people are. Uh, lots and lots of young people grew up in the church, but their faith wasn't their faith. Their faith was their parents' faith. And now they're getting older and they're confronted with a world that is really, really filled with all kinds of different ideas about what's right, wrong, what's true and false, what even if there is such a thing as true and false, or uh, if there is such a thing as objective truth. Um, you know, we can sort of cliche coyly throw out the answer there when someone says, well, I don't believe there is any such thing as absolute truth. Then we can say the standard, well, does that include the statement you just made? That's a legitimate critique of that statement. But most people aren't really thinking about whether there even is such a thing as objective truth. We all live in it. We all deal with it every day without thinking about it. But we don't necessarily think that through. And so when, some, when, when, when someone asks us questions for it, if we can't give legitimate answers, um, then, then of course that puts them off. But we have to stop and ask ourselves, why don't I have answers to my faith? Why do I believe what I believe? And uh, you know, is it just because I grew up with it? Or is it because I can give, because I have a, an objective understanding of why I believe Christianity as opposed to Islam? or Hinduism, or Baha'i, or any particular thing anywhere along the spectrum. Uh, why not be a New Ager where we're all gods and things like this and different variations of that? Um, well, if we spend time digging in and finding those answers, then we are developing a deeper, a far more deeply rooted faith. Um, maybe it's good to sort of point out that the Christian faith is not a sort of blind leap into the dark just hoping that it's true because somebody told me it was. The Christian faith, by and large, has only a very f small number of things that we have to take by faith. The amount of answers we have to the, the hard questions, the, the, the amount of foundation that is laid for us to build a reasonable faith upon uh, is manifold. It's myriad. There's tons and tons of this. Um, but the idea that um, 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 that we sort of take this blind leap of faith. That's not the Christian faith. I have to believe in a God I've never seen, sure, but the evidence for his existence is overwhelming. Um, I do believe Jesus rose from the dead. I wasn't there to see it, but there are objective eyewitness testimony to verify that. In other words, there are not too many things left that I need to take purely by faith. Um, and so, but I came to understand that through years and years of study, through uh, asking the questions myself and trying to find those answers or being challenged by somebody that I just sort of assumed that they believed a certain thing, but when they it turned out they didn't, it caused me to go back and make sure that what I was saying uh, made sense and was, was based in fact. It wasn't just something I was just kind of hoping was true, but couldn't really see that it was. And so um, so the idea here that, that it helps us to build our own faith is another pretty valuable reason to study apologetics. Um, another reason why we would study is because it helps us get a better understanding of where people are coming from. When people, when we ask questions or people ask questions of us, it can help us understand how they maybe came to believe what they did. Now two things happen there. One is that it helps us to present good answers to the questions that they're asking and not spend time answering questions they're not asking. But it also can maybe help paint a picture for us to help us understand that there's a reason why they came to where they did. And that reason is important to them. It's one of the fundamental reasons they believe what they do. Some path led them to where they are, something about their upbringing, some experience they had, some time they spent studying a particular point of view. They got to where they are based on something. Nothing happens in a vacuum, and so there's some reason why they got where they are. Well, studying apologetics and learning how to ask questions and give answers, how to field questions from people that are asking, it, it helps us to understand where people come from. Uh, and to be able to speak to those issues a little bit more effectively um, and even more honestly because we're giving answers that we've pursued ourselves and it helps to build that conversation where they then maybe begin to open up a little bit more and more and suddenly a relationship is built and you're not just sharing apologetics but you're also moving into the next thing and that's what apologetics ultimately leads to and is connected to and should never be disconnected from and that is the gospel. The reason that we share apologetics, the reason we give answers, is to ultimately help people understand that it is the most reasonable, sensible thing in the world to put your trust in Jesus. And I make that statement with no hesitation. I mean, having looked at different religions, having spent years answering questions that people have asked, having had to dig into the deeper things to have those responses that are, that are meaningful and reasonable for people to consider, 
<clears throat> has led me to to a deeper faith, a deeper understanding of my faith, and a, and a much more uh, a much greater confidence in sharing the gospel. Uh, when I understand my faith and I understand where people are coming from and I, and, I, and I help answer some of those questions that clear the path, it's clearing the path that ultimately leads them to a faith and a trust in the person of Jesus Christ. And that becomes something that we have to remember is the point. The point is not just to answer the questions. The point is that they come into a personal relationship with Jesus himself. They don't become a stamp on our Christian belt like we... You know, we answered them, we defeated somebody who was anti-Jesus or something. No, it's about helping them to come to know him. And so apologetics is a wonderful tool. It's an incredibly useful tool to help people come to that place. And after all, we heard the gospel likely after someone answered our questions. But ultimately it came to the point of either acceptance or rejection, of belief or disbelief. But our belief now is based on having had some very tough things dealt with in our lives, some questions answered that we were wrestling with. But once those things are done again, now it comes to the question of the person of Christ, the fact that he came into the world and he died according to the scriptures. He rose again on the third day, again according to the scriptures, as Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, the, the gospel is there to help us not just answer the questions, but to deal with the problem of sin uh, and to understand God's love in connection with our sinfulness. That Paul would say in Romans 5, and you know, this is how we know God's love, right? That even though while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. And of course, we all know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. But these are the things we ultimately answer the questions for, to bring them to a place where they realize that not only is God real, not only did Jesus come as God in the flesh into this world, but he came because he loved us. He entered the world, he reached into our problems, into our, into our world, and he ultimately saved us from our sins by taking them upon himself at the cross. And we begin to explain the gospel to them, which we've shared many times in the past and we'll share again many times in the future. But the point of apologetics is to bring people ultimately to the person of Christ himself. It's also important that we don't disconnect our sharing of answers and our, our, our apologetic. We don't divorce that from love itself. You know, again, Peter says to share these things with gentleness and respect. Um, and so when we genuinely love the people we're talking to, even when they are hostile and antagonistic, but we love them enough to share the truth with them, hey, sometimes people aren't going to want to hear it anymore and they're going to walk away. Okay, I mean, they're, they're autonomous, they're their own person. But we take the time to answer these questions, not to win arguments or to win points, but to ultimately help people come to a saving faith. And we do that because we love them. Same reason Jesus came into the world, because God so loved the world. We also, lastly, don't want to disconnect our apologetic from something very practical in our Christian life, but is often overlooked, and that is prayer. We want to pray before we, you know, every day we start our day. We want to come before the Lord honestly and openly, taking up our cross and following after him. But start your day in fellowship and communion with God himself. To seek him out in prayer, open the word, spend time in, in devotionally in, word, in the word and in prayer with him so that you can get your heart ready for what the day holds. Because unless you're a professional apologist and you know you've got appointments to go give talks or something, then you're probably like me where you just go through your day and all of a sudden a conversation starts up or some situation happens where you find yourself with your back against the wall because some people are asking about your faith. We never know when those times are going to come. And so we always want to be prayerful and prepared. Uh, and so spend time with the Lord praying about these things. And also we want to pray for those that we might meet during the day. Lord, I don't know who you're going to bring across my path or what conversations are going to arise today, but I pray for the person that you're going to bring into my life. I pray for those people that I'm going to come across today, and I pray for opportunities that you might give me to share uh, the truths that you have made known to me and saved me through ultimately in Christ. And so we want to be prayerful about these things, and we want to remember in that that we are sowing and watering, but ultimately it's God who gives the increase. Uh, no one comes to faith simply because we answered enough questions. Ultimately, it is the Holy Spirit that brings conviction that leads to conversion. It's ultimately the Holy Spirit who takes the things that we share uh, and, and, and ultimately brings that, that word, that truth, and, and allows it to kind of strike the heart and maybe break it open so that, that seed can be planted and ultimately bear fruit. It's the Holy Spirit has to be in the middle of what's going on here. We have to be trusting that God is at work and that we're simply being used in, by, as a, like a tool in his hands, uh, ultimately to help uh, cultivate 
uh, what's going on there that fruit might come. But he is ultimately the one who brings fruit, who brings people to faith, who brings people to belief. So that's why we study apologetics. Those are just some reasons why we study apologetics. No doubt you've got thoughts yourself as to, you know, well, here, here's another thought why, why we should do it and that. Well, hey, I'd love to hear that. Go ahead and share that in the comments in the YouTube, uh, our YouTube channel or on my personal website at parsonspad.com. You can email me, as I always uh, try to remember to mention, you can email me at, at that website at parsonspad.com or you can email me through our church website where I pastor at a Calvary Chapel, Franklin. Uh, dot com. And uh, we invite you to come out and visit us if you're in the area or if you live somewhere around Franklin, Tennessee. And um, But uh, very, very thankful that you watch. And I'm really loving the interaction and, the, and the, um, the community that's kind of forming around some of these just daily discipleship-based kinds of uh, podcasts that we do. So let me pray us out here. And I'm also, by the way, going to, uh, as I close in prayer, give an opportunity for any who might want to receive Christ uh, maybe you've uh, been asking questions. Maybe you've been on the periphery just kind of listening and watching as you watch believers live their lives and you hear them talk. And as maybe you've interacted, maybe you've been watching this podcast and you've maybe come to a place where you're like, you know something, I guess I, guess I don't really have any reason left not to come to Christ. Well, let me just add one thing to that. And that's that the reason we come to Christ is, yeah, because it makes perfect sense to follow Jesus. But the reason we follow Jesus is because we have a problem. We have a problem, and it's a big one, and it's called sin. You and I are sinners. We are. It's what we're made of. You know, we're, we're at the core of who we are. We're consumed with self. We, we, we've lied. We've cheated. We've done bad things in our lives because it's just what we are. Um, it's varying degrees. You know, well, I'm not a bad person. Well, you're not as bad as the next guy, but all of us suffer from the same disease. And it's a heart disease that Jesus didn't come to fix, but he came to give heart transplants. In other words, he came into the world to forgive us of our sins, to pay the debt that we owed of sin uh, to God, and ultimately to wipe the slate clean. And ultimately, as, as Paul would say, as he wrote to the Corinthians, that he came to make us new creations in, in him. Uh, that the old things would pass away and that all things would become new. And he ultimately changes our heart that is just a heart of, uh, of stone and replaces it with a heart of flesh, one that beats with life, one that is like a brand new heart, making us a brand new person. Yeah, we'll still stumble. We'll still fall. I'm, you know, I've been a Christian for almost 30 years and I, I, you know, I, I'm not free of sin, you know what I mean, as far as my behaviors go. That's practically speaking. But positionally speaking, I'm no longer judged for my sin because God has sent his son, because Jesus, who's God in the flesh, ultimately came and paid my debt. Past, present, and future. All the sin that I've ever committed and all the sin that I may yet commit. I live in response to that love and forgiveness, but I'm not perfect here on this side of eternity, but God's grace has covered me and has set me free. And so I'm gonna pray and give you an opportunity to come to Jesus yourself, that you might put your trust in him and become a new creation in Christ, walking with him and following him until the day you see him face to face in heaven. And so if you're ready to make that commitment, to walk with him, to allow him to change you from the inside out, uh, to receive that gift of his grace and forgiveness, and I'm gonna invite you to pray in just a moment as well. Father, we thank you and love you. We praise you and bless you. You've been so good to us in so many ways. We thank you that you sent your son to die for our sins, to wash us clean, to make us new creations in Christ. And we thank you that you've also uh, given us in your word uh, and in the life of Jesus himself, such an anchor for truth to cling to, to ultimately be held by. Maybe that's even a better way to say it. We don't cling to you per se, ultimately, but we stand upon the truth that you've provided. And so Father, we just pray you'd help us to walk in this truth, to learn more about this truth, uh, to stand on it, to share from it, to proclaim your goodness and grace and forgiveness as ambassadors of Christ. We proclaim this message of reconciliation. We thank you, Lord, for all of these things. And Father, as your children, those of us who are believers, help us to, you know, to take it upon ourselves, to dive into these things further, to look into them so we understand them, so that we can share them and answer the questions when they come, ultimately that people might come to believe and put their trust in Jesus himself. And if that's you here today, where you're ready to come and become a follower, a disciple of Jesus, then I invite you to pray with me now. Heavenly Father, I come before you thanking you that in spite of the fact that I am a sinner, that you so loved me and sent your Son to die for my sins, so that if I would believe in him, I'd have everlasting life. 
And I thank you that he paid my debt on the cross once and for all, and that he rose from the dead and lives forevermore at the right hand of the Father. And I pray, Lord, that you would help me to walk in his ways, to read about him, to learn about him, to read your word and find out what you're all about, that I might grow in my faith and that I might live a life of response, of thanksgiving in response to your love and grace and mercy toward me, a sinner. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me and setting me free. Thank you for promising to walk with me every day of my life until I see you face to face. And thank you that when I do see you face to face, no longer will I have to be ashamed, but I can come in as an invited son, an invited daughter. Thank you so much. I just praise you and bless you for this and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you and look forward to catching up with you next time. By the way, if you prayed that prayer, I'll invite you to reach out to me. Do send me a note or comment in the uh, you know under the video or something. Let me know because I'd like to help you find a, a church that you can grow in your faith. I'd like to make sure you've got a Bible and all these things. And I invite you to continue to watch as we continue to go through God's word and as we talk about things like this. But God bless you and we'll see you next time.